With no forensic evidence found at a murder scene, investigators were baffled. But they suspected that the victim's dog had witnessed the crime. If she had, forensic scientists needed some way to find out what the dog had seen. North Liberty, Iowa is such a small town, it doesn't take much effort to know your neighbors. But one resident the townspeople seldom saw was 28-year-old John Hebel. John was somewhat of a recluse. John kind of stayed to himself. It wasn't unusual if we didn't see him for a month. He'd be doing things at, at his home or repairing things or out with his friends. At one point in time in John's life, he was a uh, narcotics user and very possibly also a narcotics dealer. In February of 1999, John's mother was really worried. She hadn't heard from her son in over two months. We'd been trying to reach my son and that he wasn't answering and we were afraid something was wrong. So she called the local sheriff, who found John's van parked in his driveway. But no one answered the door. They smelt an odor coming from inside the trailer. He described that odor as being the odor of death. The officers forced their way through the trailer door and found Hebel dead, slumped in a chair. The body appeared to be in a position of someone who would have been watching TV and had laid their head down on their arm, on their pillow, and gone to sleep. The body was completely covered. I'd had a blanket over the entire body, over the head, over all of the body. He had been shot twice in the back of the head with a 22 caliber pistol. The advanced date of decomposition revealed the murder happened weeks earlier. There were no signs of forced entry, and the trailer doors were locked. That indicated to us that someone actually left the residence and took the time to use a key to bolt that door shut again, keeping other individuals from being able to easily access and enter the trailer. In the home, police found a small amount of marijuana and some drug paraphernalia. John didn't deserve to have this happen to him. He may not have been the perfect person in the world. He may not have had the best lifestyle in the world. But I could almost guarantee you would give you the shirt off his back. But John's prized collection of guns was missing, including a uniquely customized Gold Cup 45 semi-automatic pistol. This Colt Gold Cup was described to me from one of John's friends is you would have to pry that gun away from his cold, dead fingers. He was able to take guns apart and work on them, repair them, customize them, put fancy gold on them, things like that. It sounded as if John had been killed for the, the gun collection. And another one of John's prized possessions was missing, his three-year-old husky, Keisha. Oh, he loved his dog. His dog was his life. He, she was his baby. She had a lot of hamburgers, a lot of pizza, hot dogs, things like that. I think she ate mostly people food. She was very spoiled. Police soon learned that a dog matching Keisha's description was found a month earlier, wandering aimlessly several miles away. She was just standing in the middle of the street, dazed, looking around like, where am I? What am I doing here? John's parents identified Keisha. The evidence suggested she had been driven there and dropped off. Keisha was found during January when the roads are typically dirty and muddy, that Keisha's condition was, was pretty clean. The crime scene showed that the dog's leash 
which normally was kept inside the trailer next to the door, was actually in the victim's van. It suggested the victim's van had been used to transport the dog and dispose of the dog. This was just one unusual detail in an investigation that was to become even more bizarre. An autopsy on 28-year-old John Heppel revealed he had been killed long before his body was found. But the medical examiner was unable to determine exactly when he was killed. Without an idea as to when the time of death is, it obviously becomes very much more difficult to determine who are suspects and who are people that you can rule out. Heppel's dog, Keisha, was found on January 22nd. Heppel's telephone answering machine had messages not yet listened to. The earliest unheard message was left that same day, January 22nd. John would not use the answering machine to screen his telephone calls. If someone called, John wanted to talk to him. So therefore, we knew that January 22nd, 23rd, John was dead. With this information, authorities questioned John's friends and family. We had three primary suspects in this case, Mike Harding, Andrew Rich, and Sharon Snyder. The first suspect, Mike Harding, was a friend of John Hebbel's. A witness recalled seeing Harding's truck parked near Hebbel's home around the time of the murder. Mike Harding was good friends with John. We knew that John and and Mike had some narcotics business together. But Harding had an alibi for the time of the murder, and he passed a polygraph test. The next two suspects, Andrew Rich and Sharon Schneider, were friends of John's, who lived about an 18-hour drive away in Gray Bull, Wyoming. We learned from a good friend who saw Andrew Rich and John Heppel together on January 18th of 1999 that, in fact, uh, Andrew Rich had been at the trailer house of John Hebel. But Andy said John was alive and well when he and Sharon left to return home. Police searched the couple's apartment and found marijuana, methamphetamine, and several 22 caliber bullets, the same caliber used to kill Hebel. These bullets, along with the slugs from Hebel's body, were sent to the FBI lab for a neutron activation test. That's where the lead is uh, shaved off of the bullet. It's melted down, and atoms are counted. Counted, then compared. But the atomic composition of the bullets recovered from John Hebel was not what investigators had hoped for. The results showed us that the bullets that we had recovered from John were not the same bullets that was removed from Andy Rich's house in Grable, Wyoming. Investigators found smudge marks on the inside windows of Rich's Jeep similar to those caused by animals when pressing their noses against the glass. Was it possible that Rich used his car to transport Hebel's dog across town after the murder? Police took Keisha's nose print in the same way they collect human fingerprints. Each dog's nose print is as unique as a fingerprint. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get the type of smudges or prints actually from the uh, vehicle that would enable us to do that, but it certainly was um, an interesting element that we pursued for some time. After several months with no forensic evidence and very few leads, the investigation into John Hebel's murder was starting to turn cold. So investigators turned to Hebel's dog for more information. As it turns out, that dog was going to play a very important part in, uh, in solving John's uh, death. A year after John Hebel's murder, police suspected Hebel's best friend, Andy Rich, was somehow involved in his death. 
but they had no proof. All investigators knew was that Rich had some unusual career aspirations. We knew that his lifelong goal was to be a hitman for the mafia. We had interviewed past girlfriends. We had interviewed other associates of Andy Rich. And he always portray portrayed himself as a tough guy. That's, that's how Andy Rich wants to be remembered. We were concerned that Sharon Snyder, um, the girlfriend of Andrew Rich, had information that she was fearful about telling us. The impression was that she was being guarded out of fear, her fear, of Andrew Rich. That was a good punching bag for him. He um, abused me a lot. There was a lot of abuse, um, not just physical. There was a lot of verbal abuse. Police looked into Sharon's background to see if she had ever been involved in illegal activity, and they found something. Sharon Snyder was purchasing guns in a different location. She would give those guns to Andy Rich. Some of those guns went to John Hebble. We had a violation of the federal statute. The federal firearms and narcotics statute was the wedge that we used to split Andy Rich and Sharon Snyder. Sharon told a different story about that visit with John Hebble. I honestly couldn't live with myself anymore. I had to face up to whatever was going to happen to me. Sharon said she dropped Andy off at Hebel's home about three days before the murder, then left to visit her daughter about an hour's drive away. A few days later, Andy arrived driving John's van. They put some of his guns into their car, took John's van to his home, and then drove their car back to Wyoming. I had no idea that John was dead, no. I had no idea about that. I had wonders of why he had these guns. After a brief stay in Wyoming, Sharon said that Andy left alone with the guns. Took off in the middle of the night or around 4 o'clock in the morning and headed to Texas. He was gone three weeks. And it was Andy's own stupidity for telling me where he was going. We started to learn things from Sharon that we had suspected all along. And at that point in time, um, it became really important for us to find any information that we could that was going to corroborate what Sharon had to say. Police visited the man Andy Rich stayed with during that trip to Texas. He said Rich had given him an unusual gold cup 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol to pay off a drug debt. But by this time, a year later, he no longer had the gun. Investigators then located a second man Rich visited on that trip, who still had in his possession a box of ammunition Rich had sold to him. Inside the box, investigators found several short black and white hairs. Microscopic analysis confirmed that the hairs were from an animal but there were no roots attached, so nuclear DNA testing was impossible. But they were able to extract mitochondrial DNA from the hair. Mitochondrial DNA is passed to animals and humans only from the mother. Joy Halverson, a California veterinarian, specializes in animal DNA. It will not be as a uh, unique profile as I might get from blood or saliva or hair with a root, but it will still allow me to say, yes, this sample matches the reference dog or it doesn't match the reference dog. Breeds of dogs and to some extent cats today are really only a few hundred years old. And so they don't differ that much that you could definitively say, for example, well, that's a Dalmatian. Halverson performed a PCR test, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's basically like taking one page out of a book and ignoring the rest of the book and Xeroxing that page a million times. And now you have that page in so much quantity that you can see it. Then the sample was sequenced to get a visual representation of the DNA type. 
When she compared the DNA from the hair in the ammunition box to a sample of Keisha's hair, she found a haplotype in both sets that was extremely rare, occurring only in one in 300 dogs. The chance of having that match just by random was pretty low. Uh, combined with, I'm sure, the circumstances of the case, if I were sitting on the jury, I would find that to be a compelling piece of evidence in the case. This was forensic proof that Rich was in possession of an item stolen from John Heppel. Then, investigators got another break. The man who was given the gold cup pistol said he still had the gun box. Inside was a note listing all of the custom alterations made to the pistol, as well as the costs. Doug Vinoy asked me if I thought that was John's handwriting, and um, I thought it was. But to be sure, investigators needed an expert. For that, they turned to Gary Licht, a forensic document examiner. He compared the note to known samples of Hebel's handwriting. The question material was written with somewhat heavy pressure. In the known writings, that was also written with that same sort of pressure. They were also all hand printed, and his known writings also relied heavily on printing and not cursive. He looked for unique features in individual letters in John's known writings, features he then tried to locate in the question document. In the creation of other letters, such as a lowercase d, I look to see if it's made with one stroke. In other words, if the pen moves down on the stem, back up slightly, and counterclockwise motion forms the loop on the lowercase d. Based on his comparisons, Licht was able to draw a definitive conclusion. I was able to identify the writer of the question material as John Hebel. Proof that it was Hebel's gun and no other that Andy took with him to Texas. Based on the handwriting analysis and the dog DNA, Andy Rich was arrested and charged with John Hebel's murder. He was nothing. He was a user of people. He would manipulate, he would use them um, for his own gain. He didn't care about anybody. He didn't care about anybody but himself. In court, Rich had an interesting response to the forensic evidence against him. The forensic evidence showed that Andy Rich was in John Hebel's home around the time of his murder. Based on the position of the body, prosecutors believe Rich killed Hebel after he fell asleep in the living room watching TV. The motive was apparently money. Rich wanted to sell Hebel's gun collection for either cash or drugs. The shooting may have agitated Hebel's dog. To stop the barking, Rich put Keisha in Hebel's van, then drove her several miles away before letting her out in a strange neighborhood. Little did he realize that Keisha's hair would be found in the stolen box of ammunition, and that canine DNA testing would prove it came from Hebel's beloved dog. Andy hated that dog. Andy could not stand Keisha. I don't know why he spared her. I have no idea. How can you spare an animal and, and shoot a human? When Rich sold Hebel's prized pistol in Texas, he left the note inside with handwriting that matched Hebel's known handwriting samples. The witness testimony and the forensic testimony piled together just added up like bricks in this case. And it was because of the two and putting those two together that we were able to be able to solve this case in the first place. Douglas Eugene Van Oy. On the day before his murder trial was to start, Andy Rich made a surprise announcement. He said, I killed John Hebel for his guns. But he never turned around and never addressed the family, never um, apologized for what he had done or 
or showed any remorse for what he had done. I was somewhat stunned by that. Um, I thought that that was the point in time where he would accept responsibility and do the right thing. The parents and family of John Hebel were sitting behind him. It was his chance to try to make amends. He failed miserably in doing that. Even at Andrew Rich's own admittance, John was one of his five best friends in this world. And he's, he's so much a piece of trash that he killed one of his best friends. Rich pleaded guilty to first degree robbery and voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 35 years in prison. In exchange for her cooperation, Sharon Schneider was charged for drug possession and was sentenced to six months in a halfway house and two and a half years probation. Sharon was not a witness to the crime. Sharon had pieces of the puzzle that she gave us that we could put together to solve the crime. I think it's very interesting how Keisha helped ultimately to be able to solve the crime of the homicide of her master. I feel that Keisha solved the case along with the detectives. I mean, she provided the evidence against Andrew Rich. She got her man.